I recently had the privilege of spending some time with Archpriest Lawrence Farley of St. Herman of Velasco Orthodox Church in Langley, British Columbia. Father Lawrence runs the blog No Other Foundation and has written many books, especially on topics relating to Holy Scripture. We had some great conversations and he generously agreed to sit down for an interview. And we're going to be releasing episodes from this interview over the next weeks and months. So please subscribe to get notified of when they're available. By Western Christians, I assume probably one means um, Protestant evangelical Christians in particular. Um, uh, I'm not sure that Roman Catholic contemporary approaches to Scripture differ as much from ours as theirs do. Um, and most of the people that I that I talk to share my experience of being a former Protestant evangelical Christian. Um, so when I talk about uh, Western Christians, that's those are the Western Christians that I'm kind of talking about. Um, and in my own experience as a Protestant evangelical converted to Christ in the Jesus movement in 1970 or and shortly thereafter, thousands of years ago, um, they had the idea that the Bible was kind of like a set of uh, IKEA instructions for assembly. You know, you, you, this is this is how you live. Assemble this and do this. Um, um, it's it's the modern um, uh, version of what in the Reformed tradition they would call the regulative principle of worship. Get this from a dear friend of mine who's from a member of the Free Church of Scotland. And the regulative principle of worship says the Bible gives you the instructions as to how to worship, and of course other things as well, how to live, what to believe. Uh, but in particular in worship, if it doesn't say do it, don't do it. What's not prescribed is proscribed. What's not, you know, what it tells you to do, do. If it doesn't tell you to do something, it's forbidden. Um, um, it's a, which makes, gives you a fairly stripped down uh, liturgical tradition, as, as you might imagine. Um, you sing psalms, you pray, you preach, and uh, uh, don't kiss anything, essentially. You know, no gospels, reckons, things like this. And so, um, but even if it's not quite so rigorously and um, systematically thought out in evangelical tradition, they still have the understanding that the Bible um, tells you all that you need to know. Um, and of course, by the Bible, they they have taken the Bible out of its original historical ecclesiastical context, and it's it's the book. I remember, there was a an evangelical charismatic chap, but um, Pentecostal by the name of Winky Pratney, his actual name, I think. Well, it's hard to imagine that his mother actually named him Winky, but at any rate, but anyway, Winky Pratney was an inspired youth 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 pastor, and he said, when God came to save us, He gave us His Son, and He gave us His book. I thought, interesting. Uh, almost like you had two incarnations, you know, Christ and his twin, possibly. He wouldn't have said that. But, um, but that was the idea. You had the, 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 the scripture was uh, decontextualized, taken out of its original ecclesial context, and now it's, now it's the book. Um, so it, it, it was almost a two-pronged revelation, Christ and the scriptures. Um, the church nowhere in sight, you know. So um, the... the Normal evangelical Protestant Western way of reading the scriptures is you kind of read the scriptures as if it more or less fell from heaven a little bit, um, and uh, it's authoritative because it's inspired. And they didn't don't ask too much about what that actually means, but the, you get the impression that um, the authors who wrote it it was inspired because while they wrote it, the inspiration switch was on. You know, they're just St. Paul's just kind of walking around being St. Paul, and then you do click, turn on the inspiration switch, and you, you write Romans, and then click, turn it off, and now you just go back to being a fallible St. Paul. Uh, so again, take it out of its original original uh, historical context. Um, um, so it, there's, it, it, this means that there is, it, it's taken out of the flow of history, and that using history, using the fathers, using, for example, the apostolic fathers, as the prism with which to view the scriptures is, is just simply gone, because it, it's gone from that context. So um, I remember talking to a uh, Plymouth Brethren type person uh, uh, about the Eucharist. What does the Bible say? Both agree that the Bible is the authoritative word of God, and what the Bible says Christians believe, but what does it mean? Since it's not self-interpreting, you got to 
interpret it. Um, our lens would be the consensus of the fathers, because we put the Bible back into its ecclesial context, that the Bible uh, 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 is, is read by the church, was written by the church, and, is, you know, and, is, and the church worship and life forms the context out of which you read the thing. Um, and so I was saying that the, the, um, uh, the scriptures talk about the Eucharist as the, as the body and blood of Christ. It is the, the real body and blood of Christ, not just some symbol, but the real body and blood of Christ, not through molecular transformation, but you know, spiritually, which is to say in reality, uh, it is the real body and blood of Christ. And as confirmation of this, um, I was appealing to the words of St. Ignatius of Antioch, um, Bishop of Antioch, who was martyred in about 107 or so, therefore was con uh, his ministry was in the latter part of the, fr of the first century, and it was saying that St. Ignatius talked about it as the, 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 the Eucharist as um, uh, the flesh of Christ, the body of Christ, which was conceived by the Virgin and crucified and, you know, and glorified. His response was, yeah, but St. Ignatius' epistles aren't in the Bible. Again, he'd been radically decontextualized, um, and so he could just simply be dismissed and uh, put out of the room and the door locked behind St. Ignatius, and then you, just, you, know, you could just get on with interpreting the Bible however you liked, uh, uh, more or less like John Darby and the Plymouth Brethren and things like that. But, but, but my point wasn't that St. Ignatius' epistles were in the Bible. My point is that St. Ignatius' epistles were written in the flow of history in which the Bible was written. So St. Ignatius would have... Um, uh, gotten this doctrine from somewhere. The apostles went throughout the world uh, teaching the church uh, things about Christ, things about uh, salvation, things about righteousness, things about sin, things about the Eucharist, uh, how to do the Eucharist, what it meant, how often you did it. Um, and uh, this teaching would be received by the, by the church and reflected in the ministry of St. Ignatius. I mean, he, he didn't make this idea up himself or you know, dream it up from reading the Bible after after uh, you know, uh, insufficient coffee or something, I guess, he got this idea from somewhere, namely from the uh, apostles, uh, as a part of the apostolic tradition, as, as, as the Orthodox would say. So um, um, uh, the apostles not only gave this tradition orally, which is where St. Ignatius got it, they also wrote stuff, like First Corinthians, uh, so that there is a harmony between the, what, the, what the apostles wrote and what the apostles taught orally, which was preserved in the churches, so that the um, uh, the church's oral tradition, which is enshrined in its liturgy and in the brains of the fathers and and, and stuff like this, uh, has to be consistent with what they wrote, because it's the apostles that both wrote and taught, so that the uh, the stuff that the fathers got from the apostles, especially early, and you can't get too much earlier than St. Ignatius of Antioch, uh, who's was contemporaneous, whose, whose life was uh, contemporaneous with the last of the apostles. Um, uh, he would have got this idea from them, and so that becomes the lens through which you read this, the scriptures. To say that the, the to put the scriptures back into their ecclesial context means that the um, the church um, received the scriptures in the same way as it received the oral teachings of the apostles, and uh, we can we can receive what that oral teaching was, because Ignatius said it, and, I don't know, Clement of Rome, and all, all, of, all of the other early apostolic fathers, so-called, uh, taught the same thing, so that their consensus becomes the lens through which you read the scriptures. The, everybody has a lens through which you read the scriptures. It can be um, um, the Augsburg Confession, it can be, it can be the, West, the Westminster Confession, it can be the 39 Articles, for a smaller lens. Uh, um, it, it can be uh, Thomas Aquinas, uh, whatever. It, it, it can be you know what the what your latest Pentecostal televangelist says. But everybody's got a lens to interpret the scriptures because the scriptures isn't one book. The scripture is is a library. So what I mean, it's, what's what's the message of the Bible? It's like saying what's the message of the library? I mean, you need some sort of a lens to make coherent sense out of the library, um, and so everybody needs a lens. The Bible is not self-interpreting. Um, the proof that the Bible is not self-interpreting is that intelligent, pious men from all traditions come up with radically different ideas about what the, about what the Bible says. You have it, thousands and thousands of Protestant denominations. Um, uh, you have the Orthodox interpretation. You have the Catholic interpretation. You got you know. So, um, and it's not the case that all the stupid people are in this church and all the smart people are in that church. You get to, so you should take the church as the smart people in it. No, you got smart, pious. Uh, uh, good people 
throughout all the traditions who are disagreeing. So the fact that all these people who are equally smart and pious disagree proves that what they're interpreting is not self-interpreting. That's why you've got all these different interpretations. So everybody needs a lens. And the Orthodox say that the lens is the apostolic tradition, it's the consensus patrum, it's the consensus of the fathers. There's a astonishing diversity in the fathers. There's disagree about lots of stuff, which makes their broad uh, and I- impressive agreement that they had, the consensus, that that's all the more um, uh, impressive and significant. And it's, it's e- ecclesiastically significant, uh, and it's, I would suggest it's exegetically significant as, as, as well. That becomes the lens through which we can uh, read the scriptures. So that when St. Paul talks about the Eucharist and says, um, uh, the bread which we break is a not a koinonia, a sharing, a participation in the body of Christ. The cup of blessing which we bless is a not a koinonia, a sharing, a participation in the blood of Christ. You say, what does that mean? When you have all of the fathers from various climates say, it means that the Eucharist is the blood of Christ, not, not merely symbolic or emblematic, but it is the blood of Christ, that you know that they have the real stuff, because that's, the, that's what St. Paul means. That's the lens through which we experience it. Um, so I suggest that that would be the main difference between the evangelical reading of the scriptures and the Orthodox reading of it. Um, the, in evangelicalism, there is no consistent unified lens. They have accepted the idea that the Bible is is self-interpreting and that any clear thinking individual can just open the Bible and understand it. Um, so uh, they say we don't need a lens and so you, 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 each man becomes his own lens. Um, you don't need the Pope to tell you what it means. Each man is effectively his own Pope, if I may say it like that. Um, and that's why you have a um, I would, I would suggest confessional chaos in Protestantism. Uh, all different denominations, each coming up with different different interpretations because there is no standard authority. Um, the Roman Catholic Church, we have the magisterium as the authority to tell you what the, the faith is and what the scriptures mean. Uh, the Orthodox have the apostolic tradition, the consensus of the fathers. Uh, but that's the, that's the, the main the main the main difference we have an ecclesial lens for reading the scriptures and everybody else is in evangelical Protestantism has um, an individualistic lens uh, each man makes a does what is right in his own eyes to coin a phrase and that would, that would, I would suggest that would probably be the main difference I hope you enjoyed this episode of my interview with Father Lawrence Farley Please subscribe below to get notified of future episodes, and please leave a comment below to let me know what you thought of this video.